Michael Rifkin, would you like to start by giving us your broad thoughts on the situation the Conservative Party finds itself in? I think we're in a very, very serious position. I don't want to attribute blame, but the reality is that over the last few weeks, last few months, uh, we've begun not only to make a, a jumble of incoherent decisions, but our reputation, I don't just mean the Conservative Party, I mean the United Kingdom, has taken a very severe blow. Uh, the rest of the world is used to seeing the United Kingdom as governed in a responsible, coherent way. The Conservative Party in particular has had a reputation uh, of that kind. And as others have said, that reputation has been totally trashed uh, in the last couple of months. It's a tragedy, not just for my party, it's a tragedy for the country's own reputation. It'll take quite some time uh, to get that reputation back. And that will be significantly influenced, in my judgment, by uh, who emerges as the next prime minister. And presumably Britain's enemies will be looking on at this. This must have an impact on... Yes, I wouldn't want to ex exaggerate that too much. Uh, the reality is on national security issues, uh, there's not only no division within the Conservative Party, there's no actual fundamental division between the Conservative Party and the opposition. Uh, on the issue, I think you're really in, in for, in referring to the Russia-Ukraine war. And on that issue, there is a huge amount of bipartisan support uh, from the Labour Party, the Liberal Democrats, uh, other parties. So uh, I, I don't think that is significantly influenced. But having said that, uh, the gentleman in the Kremlin certainly enjoy the United Kingdom occasionally making itself look ridiculous. And in terms of where the Conservative Party should go next, you have a preferred candidate in mind. Well, I, I do have, but I'm not going to dwell on that significantly at, at this stage. What I want to respond to first, uh, if that's the area of conversation you want to have, uh, is that fundamental to the decision that's being taken over the next few days by Conservative members of Parliament and possibly by party members is not the party interest, it's the public interest. Now, I can only offer a judgment. It's a personal judgment. But I've been around quite some time. I think the idea that the uh, government, which suffered a loss of almost 50 or 60 ministers who resigned in order that Boris Johnson should realize he had to step down, the idea that that same government, essentially, uh, the Conservative MPs as a whole, should even contemplate bringing him back a couple of months later uh, is absurd in itself. But what would make it utterly indefensible is that the, if not the only reason, it seems to be the only reason, but certainly the main reason why some MPs and party activists are encouraging that, is that Boris Johnson would have a better chance than other leaders at, of winning the next general election. I've never heard a worse example of putting the party perceived interest, because it might not even be true, but putting the party's political interest before the public interest. And I will happily explain why in my judgment the public interest could not remotely be served uh, by the return of Boris Johnson. I suppose the case that would be made by some of those MPs who are backing Boris Johnson is, as he puts it, he got the big calls right on coronavirus, on Ukraine. What is it about his premiership that makes you so yeah, wary of him? I can answer that directly. The single most fundamental issue facing the United Kingdom at the moment, and not just because of Liz Truss's mini budget, is the state of the economy. Admittedly, it's not just Britain that has economic problems, but we happen to have them, and we have them in spades. Inflation going up to 12%, interest rates going up, a lot of people suffering as a consequence. So the most crucial judgment that should be being made by my colleagues, Tory MPs and party activists, if it comes to the vote, and I'm one of them, uh, is who would make the best manager of Britain's economy? Now, with all due respect to Boris Johnson, he has many talents. I'm well aware of that as anyone. Uh, he's not actually well known for his uh, coherence or strength of views or even interest in economic policy. That's not his scene. It never has been his scene. He doesn't probably understand it. I don't necessarily criticize him for that. It's a complex subject. But you know, the, the current chancellor understands it. Rishi Sunak understands it. Uh, and Penny Morden probably understands it a lot better. So it's who it's, it's, the policy on Ukraine is not going to change depending on who the prime minister is. The policy on COVID is not going to change. The economy is fundamental. And we don't even know Boris Johnson's views on that, never mind whether he has the competence or ability, because certainly while he was prime minister, 
he did he made sure no interest in basic economic issues i suppose before we let you go the final thing i should ask you is as someone who has been there done that seen it what would be your advice to your colleagues who are now in parliament on what they should consider over the next few days as they work out who should be the next leader i think there is a very dangerous risk on past record that if boris johnson is one of the two final candidates even if he's miles behind rishi sunak uh, he could end up being chosen by the party membership sadly we've had experience of that starting with ian duncan smith who turned out to be a very poor leader and had to go quickly. Now we've had Liz Truss and so forth. So I think the public interest is, has to be the prime consideration. And the public interest is twofold. Now I'm not talking about the party interest, it's the public interest, is first of all that Britain slowly, because it will be slowly, restores its reputation for coherent and professional and grown-up government and chooses a leader who is capable of providing that kind of leadership and secondly, given that the vast majority of the public, including many conservatives, are struggling with the cost of living increases that we're all seeing and the problems of the economy, we have to have not just a chancellor. Chancellor is number two in the government. The prime minister must be somebody who's economically coherent, who understands the economy, who has shown that he does understand it, and that he will be able to work closely with the chancellor in restoring our economic strength. Now, in the case of Johnson, I'm afraid it's not this, uh, this is not a theoretical question. Uh, he was prime minister for two or three years. He showed no interest, never mind leadership, on economic policy. And he, it may be argued that at that time that wasn't the crucial issues. Well, you know, it is now. And uh, I don't know Rishi Sunak. I've not met him personally, so I'm not simply uh, an automatic adherent. Uh, but what I do know is that during the, the Trust Sunak campaign, one of the reasons Sunak lost, probably, was because he was brave enough to put the public interest and say, I cannot support tax cuts unless they're properly funded and not while the economy is in a mess. And he said that, and it probably cost him more votes than it gained him, but he's been proven 100% right. So as a citizen affected by the way the economy may develop over the next few months, uh, then it, of the people available, he is by far the best. Uh, I'm not an automatic supporter of Rishi Sunak. Um, first of all, he was a Brexiteer, and I, I'm, I, I was a Remainer. Uh, and I've not met him. I don't know him personally. So I'm not automatically saying he's the great guy and so forth. Uh, but given the, uh, the undoubted priority we have to give to getting the economy of this country right, getting inflation down, getting a sensible uh, reputation with the markets and the rest of the world for our economic policy, uh, I was impressed by Sunak. Doing, uh, he showed his personal courage in two ways. First of all, when he was Chancellor uh, during the COVID uh, affairs, he was responsible for the introduction of the furlough scheme, which saved hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of jobs. And you don't normally get a Chancellor spending very large sums of money if it can be avoided. So he had the courage to promote that, and it was hugely successful. But also, more recently, during the trust Sunak campaign, uh, Sunak almost certainly lost votes with party members uh, because he didn't go along with the view uh, tax cuts can, must be the priority, even if they're unfunded. He said, I cannot support that. It doesn't make economic sense, and I'm not going to support it. Now, that was a brave thing to do. It may indeed have cost him the election, but it's exactly the kind of leadership that the country needs at this moment in time with regard to that. And uh, my very final point uh, it has to be Please, I say to Conservative MPs and Conservative Party members, do not support Johnson because it might be good for the Conservative Party. That's a terrible reason uh, to choose a prime minister. It's the public interest that matters, and the public interest requires somebody who is fit to do the job. Only two months ago, Conservative ministers, Conservative MPs decided that Johnson was unfit to do that job. What has changed to make him more fit now than he was then? Don't make ourselves look ridiculous at this crucial moment in time.